I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and invite you into an experience, exploration, adventure with God's living word and an opportunity for us to reflect upon what the Lord has spoken to us, uh, not only in generations, but what God is speaking now. My name is Pastor Harshaw, coming from First Baptist Church, 101 South Wilmington Street, uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina. And we're a church that's 208 years old, and uh, we celebrate the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, phenomenal history, and wonderful membership, and uh, wonderful disciples and missionaries that carry on the work of the kingdom. And we believe in the kingdom of God as uh, outlined in scripture. It's rooted in Old Testament and fulfilled and manifested in a different way in the New Testament teachings with Jesus who said that the kingdom has arrived, and not only that, but the kingdom is in you as you follow my lead. And so we're seeking to follow the lead of the Lord, that we can do the work of, of God's kingdom uh, in this present generation, in this present age. And so we are empowered by the Spirit of God. We do the best we can, but God makes a difference by giving us the precious power of the Holy Spirit, according to Acts 1.8. And we are praying for a double portion, as Elisha did with Elijah. And uh, we believe that God can bless us and bless us again and empower us and empower us again. So we invite you into that experience and pray that God is working in your heart and your life in a mighty way. And that you will be leaning on those everlasting arms. And you will take time to pray and time to bring your concerns before the Lord so that God might speak to you and the Lord might, might empower you. We are in First John uh, going through uh, this experience of hearing the word of God and also seeking an, an experience with the Lord Jesus Christ through God's word. And this is, we call this an hour of renewal uh, as we uh, take time to study the word. So I invite you to get your Bible to follow along so that you can read and if you have a nice study Bible, that's helpful because you can read the notes on that to get better understanding of passages that we don't have time to really unload or unpack. And uh, also for your own devotional time or your own study time, that would be very helpful. Um, we have guiding principles as we read through this epistle, uh, this letter of 1 John, uh, hearing the story, sharing the story, and living the story. So we really want to hear what what has happened with the Christ event. Uh, we want to be able to share that story. But more than that, we want to be able to walk in that way and live that story as well. And um, the question really uh, of the day is uh, what role will, will you play? On, on last time, just a little review of where we were on, on last time. Uh, we talked about edifying writings. We talked about the positions or stations uh, in the faith as we live out our lives and we talked about the fact that knowledge of God personally but also through the word uh, is power it, it, it gives us power and and so when, when we look at this passage of scripture and I'll read it now and then say a little bit about it and so you may follow along it's the second chapter of first John way back in the latter part of the New Testament and we begin uh, where we did last time, verses 12 through 15. And we find the reasons for the elder writing to the people of faith, to that community of faith in that day. He says, I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on the account of his name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who was from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who was from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. And then that last verse we're looking at in reference today is uh, verse 15 of the second chapter. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in them. May the Lord bless the reading of his word and even more so, even more so the application. But, but let's step back for a moment and do a little review and prayerfully be able to apply it to the circumstances that we are in now with 
this national crisis uh, twofold. One is the coronavirus still taking human life and still people are contracting uh, this virus. Uh, and it's still not completely safe. And in addition to that, the virus of racism, police brutality, and now we see riots and, and uh, unplanned violence that has really taken place, at least for the real protesters it was unplanned because they wanted peaceful demonstration of the rage and the anger about watching on television what we would call the murder of George Floyd. And so, and so this word then becomes a, a word of uh, edification for us. And we talked about edifying uh, uh, writings. This edifying, or the word edification means to build up rather than to tear down and to infuse with hope and strength and to lift. And uh, that certainly is what we need in today's world. Uh, we need to be lifted and not drawn down uh, to things that are negative and evil, ugly and violent. And um, that's still the way of Christ. And uh, we have stations of positions in life. All of us have influence and all of us have something to give. We have gifts to give to the world. And uh, also when we know that, well, then we're empowered. And when we know the God who uh, has destined us, well, then we're empowered even more. And, and so we, we said that, that this letter uh, that was written was, was a direct uh, confrontation of the issues in that particular church and it came from a pastoral perspective uh, which means there was a lot of love in that relationship between the elder and what we might call the pastor and the people and then it was personal as he uh, tried particularly in these direct words that we just read uh, to apply things to the congregation uh, in different aspects that he was really dealing with and and they're, they're also not only pastoral but they're personal in that sense uh, that different groups can apply the truth of God to their station and their position, but also powerful. Now, uh, there, there's power in the Word of God, there's power in the knowledge of the Word of God, and there's a tremendous resource. Now, while we encourage you uh, to take time to read through the Psalms and the Proverbs, to read the Gospels, uh, to read the letters of the, or the epistles of Paul, you know, uh, to read what Christ uh, actually taught about the kingdom of God because it'll give you hope and it'll give you instruction but also it gives you a sense of comfort uh, in what we're going through now uh, uh, to know that, that God is with us but also the Lord is not surprised by what is taking place. And so that in that sense the word becomes an empowering resource for you uh, and for me. And, and we noted that, that really these designations of classes or stations, you know, the, the parent role, the youth role, the child role, really are, were reflections of the entire uh, congregation and perhaps levels of maturity and growth in Christ and, and also speaking to the importance of generations of believers also and how there can be an intergenerational approach in the church. And, and someone has noted that a healthy church has all the generations at work. You know, sometimes we have churches that are senior, we have churches that are just with youth, and we have churches just with middle adults, and then those are beautiful churches and wonderful. But also, you know, the whole church really is the intergenerational reality where all those are at work in a healthy congregation, working together and growing together in Christ. And so you have the children, the youth, and the parents. And in 1 Corinthians 4, 15 through 17, uh, the Apostle Paul references the fact that there is a role uh, in the, the spiritual alignment in churches or in the body of Christ more uh, accurately, where, where people then are like parents uh, because of their maturity, their experience with God. It really doesn't have anything to do with, with age, but it has everything to do with spiritual growth and development. And there are other people uh, who are youth, uh, you know, they're vibrant with their faith, but they're still learning, they're still growing. And then there are people who are like babes in Christ, uh, people who are children, um, uh, simply because you know, it's new for them and they are growing, they have a lot to learn and a lot to experience with God. And then in one sense, there's a blanket statement in First John, we believe, that basically says all of us are children of God. We all are children of God. And so in that sense, he spoke to the entire uh, congregation, but also to those, uh, those elements. And then in that speaking, there's a sense of the knowledge of God, which was stressed, 
uh, the sense of overcoming the evil one, which means that we have an adversary. Um, and that's part of biblical belief, but also Christian belief and discipleships, discipleship that we are not only have Christ or God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, but we also have Satan, the adversary, the opposite of good in the world. And some people don't like believing in that, or whatever, but whether you believe it or not, there is an evil force in the world. And sometimes there's an evil force in our nature that has to be dealt with by the blood of Christ, or by the presence of the Holy Spirit within us. And some people have to have help to get that evil out of them. And, um, and then so, so there is a sense in overcoming the evil one. There's a, stint, a sense of strength uh, that is available to those uh, who allow the word of God to live in them. And then also the, the, there's reference to the living word of God. And when God's word abides in you and you're in an intimate relationship with the Lord, that word lives in you. And, and sometimes it comes out as praise. Sometimes it comes out as a hymn, a spiritual song, a praise song. Sometimes it, it comes out as testimony. And, but, but if it's living inside of you, it will bear witness to what God is doing inside of you. Uh, to others around and so in that sense you will tell your story and you will have a narrative for what God is and has done in your life and then all of it is capped off by by the sense that Jesus is the foundation of all of these aspects and all of these generations and all of these levels of growth that, that, that the thing that brings all of it together is the reality of the foundation of Jesus Christ who is regarded in the Bible as the Son of God, the Messiah, the Redeemer of the human family. And so, and so you have all of this uh, taking place. Uh, John Westerhoff, a uh, leading Christian educator, um, uh, noted that, that there are many generations in the church and he identified it like a generation of memory, a generation with a commitment to action, and a generation with a vision and uh, and how again all of those those uh, generations need to be at work in the life of any healthy congregation so you have you have people there who could look back at times when God delivered them and answered prayer and worked miracles for them and so they are living witnesses to what God can do and then you have those who are just excited they have the energy they have the uh, uh, you know, the visibility, the opportunity to just be engaged in the world. And uh, they're about more action, commitment to action. And that is, you know, they're, they're doing stuff. They're feeding the hungry, clothing the naked. They're, they're, they're sometimes protesting or they're sometimes out telling their story of what happened in their lives. Sometimes they're, they're building relationships in the community and, and they're working in the world. And, and they are disciples of Christ and representatives of the Lord. And, and, and so they're committed to action. And then there's the generation with a vision. Uh, and that could be of any of those uh, areas that we have covered. But, 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 but God places within our spirits the ability to see things that never have been or aren't existing. And then to believe that God can bring them into creation. And every church must go through an envisioning process. And, and everyone, even in a business or in your own personal life, if you haven't done that yet, <clears throat> you need to sit down quietly in meditation and prayer. Open your Bible and say, Lord, show me uh, what you want me to do with my life or, or give me a glimpse of what my life can look like or show me what you can do with these tools I bring to you, broken though they are, and how you can create a life out of that, a destiny, a relationship, a marriage, a family, a business, a vocation. And, and so people who achieve uh, then have this sense of destiny often, but also a sense of a vision which relates to the notion of purpose, that, that, that they really do have, have, have a purpose in life. And, and, and so these multi-generations uh, in context are really important uh, in, in, in the life of, of the church, but also in recognition uh, in our society and one of the losses in our society of people playing their respective role as parents, as youth, and as children and stand within their lane and making sure that they make an impact um, in, in those ways. And I'd like to just stop there for a moment and just talk a little bit uh, about how important it is. First of all, the importance of fathers <clears throat> uh, in our lives, that, that, that we really need fathers in our lives. And I, I, I came across a book uh, 
that was recommended uh, by a Christian friend experiencing Father's Embrace by Jack Frost. And he talked about how important in families and, in, and even in the church, but also in society, how important the father role is. Now remember, the Apostle Paul saw himself as a spiritual father, and sometimes we call people in that uh, place that God has placed them because of their experience and God's hand upon their lives as apostles. They can be apostles because they're, they're encouraging growth, they're, they're tools for edification, they are mentors. And, and he was saying that how important it is for the development in any man's life in particular, but any person's life, to have a father present. And, every, and we see in our society today that that's a missing piece in so many homes and so many relationships, but it really is important. And we need more men in the church acting as spiritual fathers uh, to, to mentor those who need it, and particularly those who never have had a father physically, naturally, uh, in, the, in their lives. But listen to what he says as he, as, as he stresses uh, these, uh, these four things, first of all. The first is, is in order to grow in a healthy way, there's the need for unconditional love that is expressed by the Father. Unconditional meaning that you don't have to earn it. It's just love that abides. And if you've had a loving Father, you know what that feels like. You don't have to earn it. You're not in stress. You're loved anyhow. And it's a proper kind of love, a healthy kind of love. And then secondly, the, that love is important and that Father's embrace is important. Uh, so that you might uh, feel secure and comforted uh, in your development as a child. And all of us need to have a home that is secure, where we feel protected, we feel comfort when we're going through uh, different things. And, and God uses people in addition to what God can do uh, for you personally in your relationship with the God. God puts people in your life, whether it's your blood father, your relative father, or a surrogate father, or an apostle or a spiritual father, and it could even be a pastor or an elder or a bishop or someone in the life of the church or a deacon, um, or who then, or a deaconess, who plays that role in, in a sense, that parenting role. And, and then thirdly, there's a need for, for praise and affirmation. And we all need to be celebrated as if you are a star and you are somebody because you have that that person in your life who applauds you, uh, your own cheerleading squad, and that can be your dad, that can be your father, that can be your uncle, that can be your grandfather. And, and those people in your life are so important. And then fourthly, the, the need for a sense of purpose in your life, um, that, that you can discover some of that on your own, but you'll find what God does is place people in your life to help you to sort out your purpose in life and what that, that really means. And then he, he goes on to talk about four keys to the father-child relationship when you're dealing with, with, with issues of life that I think are affirmative and helpful. And, 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 and the first one is, is simply uh, your notion of a self-image, uh, you know, so you know who you are in the world. And that's why God gives us loving uh, uh, guardians and parents and people in our lives and mentors uh, and, and teachers and spiritual guides in order to help us with our notion of self-esteem as we embrace the intimacy with the Father, and that is God uh, 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 himself. And then secondly, uh, you know, you recognize your need for intimacy, and, and we all need that touch of God in our lives. And you don't grow too old for that, and you're not too young for that, and in any stage of life, you kind of need that God watching over you. And you know, like when you have a good father, sometimes you have one need for your dad uh, when you're a child. You have another need when you're a teenager. You have another need when you're a young adult. And you have another need when you're a middle adult. And believe it or not, even when you're a senior. And your father can play different roles in your life at different times. And without that, you're in need. And, and there has to be someone to stand in the gap. And if you don't get the right someone to stand in the gap, you really can go down a rabbit hole or you can get off track with all the gifts that you have in your life. And then, and then thirdly, uh, uh, the sense of embracing responsibility uh, for that relationship uh, with God and with others in the world. So if you haven't learned that <clears throat> early in your life, it's hard to give that out uh, later in your life, or, or it's hard to give that to, 
to someone if you've not had it yourself. And we say that about love, right? Also that if you haven't been sufficiently loved, but then you have a problem loving somebody else. And so that when we get into loving relationships, uh, when you get uh, a, a fiance or you're gonna get married, you gotta really understand their background in terms of how they were loved in their life because people can't give you what they don't have. And so in you know, premarital counseling, this, we deal with stuff like that so that people can have that because if you don't have it, it's gonna create a problem. And then some people don't understand that they don't have it or why they don't have it. And so then it presents challenges, but help is available and there are resources for us. And then, and then finally, the fourth key is being who God created you to be. That, that, that a, a spiritual guide, a father, uh, a, a mother and a, a parent in terms of your life is so vital because it helps you uh, to discover who God has, has made you to be. And, and, and it's not just for fathers, but, but mothers. When you look at, at all the mothers um, in the scripture and you can follow the lives and the narratives of, of, of some of these wonderful images of, of parent who is, is a mother uh, and playing the motherly role. And for all of us to be healthy, you need, we, we need both. Uh, we need the fathering, but we also need the mothering. And the beauty of God is that he's both father and mother. <laughs> and, and so God is doing that in our relationship with God. But then he's sending people to rescue us and to help us and to nurture us uh, along the way. And so just looking at 10, you know, you can look at Sarah, uh, who's described as the mother who waited. Uh, Hagar, the mother who endured. Rebecca, the mother who believed. Leah and Rachel, the mothers uh, uh, who were willing to share, who had to share. Uh, Jacobed, uh, the mother with a plan. Uh, Samson's mother, the mother uh, who followed the rules. Uh, Naomi, the mother-in-law who shared her faith. Hannah, the mother who kept her promise. Elizabeth, the mother who believed in miracles. And Mary, the mother who was uh, blessed among women simply because she bared the seed by God's amazing grace. And, and, and so when we look at these, these different stations, we need all of you. And, and the question for today's lesson, of course, is what role will you play? Are you going to be that parent that someone needs in the world now? Are you going to be that, that, that father? Are you going to be that mother? Are you going to be that young person with the energy to be committed and engaged in something that really matters? Are you going to be that child who's hungry to grow and, and willing to learn and have more experiences of what God is doing in the world? Um, and those questions are, 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 are for all of us. And uh, just to rehearse that the six uh, signs of salvation as someone has noted, the first one out of this passage, these verses, 1 John 2, 12 through 15 is, you know, the forgiveness of sins, uh, to know that even though we're broken, there's a solution, and it's the blood of the Lamb. The knowledge of Christ, secondly. Thirdly, the conquest of evil, because there is evil in the world. We see that. Uh, it screams across the, the TV every single day, um, and news reports. The knowledge of the Father, that is God, the Godhead, the deity, and then strength in terms of what God can do to make us stronger than we've been and then the abiding word of God that lives in us and then uh, we are empowered by which is a tremendous thing and, and then here it says and we'll get a chance to continue in this journey it says do not love the world or anything in the world if anyone loves the world the love of the father is not is not in them and in conclusion you know, today's lesson topic on not loving the world. And, and what we focus on in that is the spirit of the world. It's not talking about not loving the mountains and the waterways and nature and all the beauties around us and the sky and the sun and the moon. It's not talking about that part of the world. It's not talking about beautiful cities across the globe. Um, but what it's talking about is an attitude of the world that defies God and that stands against the nature and the will of God and the same kind of world that is manifested when people's rights are disregarded and when, when, when violence takes place and people are hating each other. Well, wherever that comes from, hate and violence 
and resentment and warfare, wherever that comes from, uh, that's the world that is reflected uh, in this passage. So it's not the natural world or the spiritual world, but rather it's the world that stands in opposition against God, cosmos. That's what it refers to. So, so you can't have a deep love affair with everything that's happening in the world that stands in opposition to God, and then at the same time have primary love for God. They don't go together. And so, so if you love God, well, then you're not going to love the evil in the world, or you're not going to love to see people acting out and terrible and unfortunate ways. You're not going to love sin. You're not going to love violence and hatred and division uh, as we see taking place in our nation today. You're not going to love that. Matter of fact, you're going to fight against that. You're going to do all you can to stand up against that. And you're going to open your voice and do something about that. And, and you're going to allow God then, then to use you in, in a mighty way. Well, well, we'll come back uh, to uh, that verse 15 and following when we continue to unfold uh, what this letter is for us today but prayerfully let us hear the word for ourselves and if you have heard this message and you want you know, that personal relationship uh, with the Lord some people think that it comes by being in a physical church worship service and it can God can lead people in worship uh, to accept Christ as their Savior and to give their heart to what is good and right and righteous with God and be a citizen of the kingdom. But you can do it right where you are right now. And it's just a matter of just acknowledging that, that you need help. And I, and I wanted to pray this prayer with you that I got. Uh, I often go over these prayers every morning for my own devotion. But it comes from living uh, the battle plan these little cards and uh, little prayers. And I thought this one was very fitting for, for the lesson today. <clears throat> and particularly if you're looking for that, that, that close, intimate relationship uh, with the ultimate parent who was God, God the Father, God the Mother, uh, Jesus Christ the Son, the Holy Spirit. If you want that personal relationship, well then you can pray this prayer with me. Uh, as we prepare also to close in prayer, all right? Father, I confess that I am a sinner, and I believe Jesus Christ died for me and rose again from the dead, proving that he, <clears throat> that he's the Son of God. I acknowledge my faith in him as my Lord and Savior forever. Thank you for reaching out to me in love, and providing a way for me to be forgiven, know you, and spend eternity with you. Help me live out my identity in Christ. You can say that prayer now, and you can share that prayer with someone who needs to pray that. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for the better way, the way of love and reconciliation and healing, the way of peace, and we pray for peace uh, in our land today. We pray for peace in our communities today, our cities today. Some are burning, and almost all are burning with anger. Uh, and, and Lord, we just pray that you'd move in a mighty way. We pray for the Floyd family, but we pray for all the families of people who have suffered from violence, the uh, hands of those who should be protecting, and yet lives are being taken. We pray for the deep problems of our nation and the history of our nation and how now, now we see it coming to bear in the reality day by day of what we face. We need your help. We need your intervention. We need the power of your word. We need your spirit, O oh Lord. Fill us with your spirit, but fill us with the, the love, the agape love that Jesus Christ demonstrated in that he took our brokenness on the cross, died in our place, and then rose again the third day. And for those who are seeking that intimate relationship with you, Lord, let this prayer, let your word guide them and know that they too can be included in a love that will last for an eternity. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And God's people said, amen. God bless you.